They'll sell you thousands of greens. Vernese green, emerald green, and cadmium green, and any sort of green that you like. But that particular green... never. Pablo Picasso. Welcome back to the studio, guys. We're back with another episode. This is episode three in regards to the galaxy painting, however, only the second of which focuses on this horse specifically. We're going to be spending quite a few episodes on this horse before we get into incorporating the horse into that galaxy background, but the techniques we touch on will affect how you may decide to incorporate your own subject into your galaxy-esque painting. Now, there are three terms we're going to cover today, two of which are used interchangeably and can be rather confusing even for seasoned artists. Those three are hue, tone, and value. Now, hue is going to refer to the specific name of a color, like raw sienna, burnt umber, or ultramarine blue. Tone and value are the ones that often get confused and are used interchangeably. Tone is referred to as the light or dark of a color using specifically black and white, while value is going to be the light or dark by adding a complementary or other color to achieve said lightness or darkness. Value is the harder of the two to accomplish as a good understanding of color theory is needed to understand how those hues interact to create a desired effect. The brushes that I'm using are the number four filbert, the zero filbert, and a 10-1 round. In case those who are wondering need to know, a filbert is a flat brush with a rounded tip versus a bright or flat where it would have a squared off edge. Many artists and fans have commented over the years how fascinated they are with my use of acrylic paint. The reason for this is simple. I don't paint with acrylic paints the way most people are taught to paint with acrylic paints. I paint with acrylic paints like an oil painter. More specifically, it has been said that acrylic paints are not a layerable medium and should be used in an opaque fashion rather than in glazes. Glazes have often been referred to as something that is specific to oil paints. I, however, only ever learned from artists who paint in oils, so the techniques I know and apply are commonly found in oil painting guides and not acrylic. Before all out war is declared in the comments, I feel the need to divulge a guilty pleasure, and that is the comment of you, Bob Ross. Simply put, Bob Ross was the poster boy for the episodic painter. He paved his way for painters such as Jerry Arnell, Wilson Bickford, and Donna Dewberry. But more specifically, he was the pioneer in the paint it quick in front of everyone. It'll be magic! And it was, for many, and still is. The problem is not his success or even his constantly happy outlook on life. The problem is, is that the show is filmed across the studio and carries all the appearance of a completely detailed, realistic painting, which it is not. And it's not specified what it is. Bob Ross applies techniques with his oil paints that seem like magic. Want a mountain? There you go. Snow? Not a problem. Trees? Bam! There's a tree. However, once you see those pictures up close, it's easy to see the paint strokes and the illusion falls apart. The illusion being that the style was of realism and not impressionism. That's a huge distinction that as a kid I was not aware of while watching his show. I watched Bob Ross for years and was saddened by his death in 94, but it was his death that sparked the conversation techniques in art class and years of pent up frustration and wanting to feel like I should quit and that I was never good enough dissolved immediately when I discovered that I was not a failure as an artist because I could not paint as fast. We were simply not painting in the same style. When I paint a picture, I don't want it to break down within two feet of the viewer. So to watch someone whip out what is specifically not defined as impressionism and treated like realism, it's frustrating when you take exponentially longer to paint the same subject. In the second episode, I had mentioned that I apply a filter to the reference picture in order to pull out some of the anatomy detail in the legs and the hooves. Applying a monochromatic filter is the fastest way to do this. 
However, adjusting the contrast and more specifically the color channels can further define specific areas of the anatomy to help you in your painting. When we're talking monochromatic pieces, tone and value can often be used interchangeably. However, it is important to note that tone can also be used in reference for the overall mood of the whole painting rather than a specific aspect of it. In ways I'm talking like this is a dark painting, it's sad or it's happy or it's bright. Going back to the reference picture. Because of the huge difference between the two backgrounds, it's easy to see how the underpainting can be super hard to pinpoint. A great tip would be to use the eyedropper tool in Photoshop to specify which area of the subject you are replicating in order to isolate that specific hue and value. If you're looking for an open source program, feel free to download either the GIMP or Inkscape to help you with your image manipulation. Coming back to the palette in this episode, Yellow Hansa and Cadmium Yellow have returned. The problem with using these colors in the underpainting was that both colors are transparent and not good choices to use on a black or dark surface. They simply won't show up. So when applied to a white surface on either gesso or paper, those two colors will work fine and they will both show up, but not on that black canvas. Now, if you're wondering about the opaqueness of your own paints, each tube of Liquitex paint is labeled with the opacity of the paint that it contains. With the now available transparent paints, paying closer attention to the opacity of your paint will greatly increase your success with your pigments. Resuming our discussion of tone and value, you will notice that while I am using zinc white on this piece, the value changes are not being achieved with just black or white alone. One of the delicious benefits of using a glazing technique is that using complementary colors in layers and mixing them right on the canvas rather than on the palette brings out all the hues you would see with your eye but may not realize you were actually looking at. Those who are colorblind may have huge challenges in this area and find it near impossible to achieve this effect. In the lower legs, in order to achieve the definition in the Canon, Hock, Pastern, and Hoof, there needs to be a combination of ultramarine blue, burnt sienna, to create that more purple and darker value that is later accented with pure black. The lighter tone is achieved with zinc white and blended smoothly so that both the pure hues as well as the mixed values are present. To achieve the roundness, be mindful of any lines you are creating with your brush strokes. A well blending gradient of your hues must be achieved in order to sell the overall effect of light and shadow on a curved surface. Tone is relative to the colors that are around it, so going back and double checking your reference picture is very important. This technique, while often used in oil painting, is more pronounced and notable in the media of watercolor as all layers are made visible. This application of color theory is why artists find watercolor so challenging. Now to create a clear definition between two specific surfaces, such as the two front legs, a thin but strong line needs to be created and then blended out into the different values of that respecting piece of anatomy. In the case of the front right leg, which is behind the left foreleg, a mix of cadmium yellow in combination with burnt umber and ultramarine blue creates both the defining line and the shadow sending it back behind the foreleg.
All right, so that's been our conversation about hue, tone, and value. Um, we got another episode covering these legs that will pretty much reapply everything we've uh, you know gone over here. If you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Signing off from the studio. Have a great day.